On fait l'anglais juste euh, parce qu'on on le registre et on ne sera du tout pas prêt. Donc. Si vous ne l'avez pas comprendre, on me verrait du mal à inscrire, on n'avait que poser des questions. Sans, sans souci. Okay, so we're in uh, the second uh, chapter of Perkei uh, Avot. We spoke about uh, Mishnah in the first chapter last week. This particular Mishnah, so depending on the version, is either uh, number 17 out of uh, the second chapter or number 19 in this particular Siddur. I couldn't even tell you why. Uh, not a very long uh, Mishnah. It reads uh, as follows. Rabir Azar Omer, Rabir Azar says, Hewe Shakud in Torah, you should be uh, quick to learn uh, Torah, you should be, uh, as it should come to you as a reflex or an instinct that you have some free time, you go find a place you can sit down and you can learn. And you should know what to respond to uh, Epicurus. We'll talk about this in a minute. And you should know uh, before whom you are uh, working or worshiping. So, Uh, as if to say, it should be clear to you that you're doing things that are important in God's eyes, and therefore you should be uh, diligent about the work that you do. There's actually another version of this particular conclusion, and you should know that uh, the the one for your your boss, your uh, patron, the one for whom you're working, uh, is uh, loyal. And he will pay you your uh, your reward. The alternative ending to the Mishnah is you should know before whom you're working, who is your boss, so to speak, who is uh, in charge, and that he is going to pay you your uh, uh, the the reward for your labor. Okay, easy enough to uh, to understand. Veshakud in motora, you should be uh, quick. You should be. Um, industrious in your Torah learning. When you have the opportunity, you sit down, you open a book, you listen to something, if it's on the radio, if it's uh, on the go, uh, it never hurts. Maybe what he's trying to say is that uh, when you don't schedule something, when you don't plan something, it doesn't usually happen by accident. Like it's nice to learn Torah, but you know what? I plan to eat breakfast, I plan to go to work, I plan to eat lunch, I plan to continue working, I plan to go home, I plan to go out with friends, and, Learning Torah, it's not really uh, a very popular uh, pastime. So if you don't plan it, it doesn't really happen by accident. You have an opportunity, take it up. You know, do something with it. Don't lose the opportunity that you have. It's like a commercial for the uh, Yad Acha by Avon Sol, pretty much? Yeah, for anything that takes two minutes to read that you can get for free by text, by email. You know, you have a million opportunities a day to learn uh, Torah, and we, we don't really take advantage of them. And it's true. And it's true. A little bit more, more peculiar what he says uh, in the continuation. Uh, he goes on and he says that uh, not only should you be careful about learning Torah, but you should know what to respond to uh, Epicurus. So Epicurus is an interesting concept. So we have Epicurus, the famous uh, philosopher. Uh, in the time period during which the Mishnah was composed, uh, Epicurus was a... Uh, You know, it was basically the uh, the name, the uh, the epithet that we gave to someone who was uh, your, let's say, secular uh, atheist. We have a word like that in French, Epicurean. Epicurean, okay. So I didn't know it existed in English. It doesn't well. matter. You can say someone's Epicurean. Usually, it means someone. Uh, so, so what do you mean? What what are the connotations? In of French, Epicurean? it's someone who is enjoying life. There you go. In English, you would say an Epicurean is someone who appreciates fine things, appreciates fine foods. Appreciates Indeed. Yeah. Right, so it almost sounds like you're describing your average Frenchman or Frenchman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. the, the connotations in the Mishnah are not very uh, positive. And for that matter, I don't know what the Mishnah would say about the French today, but it's a topic we can discuss. The, uh, the Epicurean described in the, uh, the Mishnah is, um, and you have to appreciate this about uh, Epicurus himself, not, you know, the, uh, the legend or, you know, the, uh, the school of thought, but he as an individual... Uh, much like many of the, uh, the classical Greek philosophers, was not a hedonist. Epicurean philosophy is not uh, eat as much as you can, drink as much as you can. It's finding quality in minimalism. So maybe this still lives on when you have uh, your, your average Epicurean who doesn't eat uh, American cheese but doesn't mind a little bit of uh, Tom de Savoie. Okay, well, have... 
two or three slices, just I can I can appreciate. You're targeting the I'll, I'll to a specific <laughs> person. <laughs> it always, right? It always comes back to uh, to this. Yeah. So uh, you know. Someone who, instead of uh, the uh, three-ton uh, package of cheese they sell you in uh, Costco, will nice take stuff. you know a few slices of something uh, of higher quality, something it's sophisticated, it's more complex, it has more flavors to it, it's a slower process. So, so what's wrong with this? What's, what's wrong? Yes, <laughs> you want to say? So no. where, where do I sign? You know? <laughs> what's what's wrong with uh, with this kind of uh, of a philosophy? The the enjoyment of life and the focus on quality is not what Hazal had against uh, Epicurus. What, uh, what bothered them was that his whole philosophy was based on, uh, on the ego, on me, what makes me feel good, what, makes, uh, what sounds right. And his barometer for, uh, for justice, for intellect, for, uh, for truth is basically what makes sense to me. So Epicurean philosophy is a very, a very selfish philosophy. It's effectively the philosophy of me. Here's what I like. This is what tastes good. This is what smells good. This is what feels good. And uh, if your ideas make sense to me, I accept them. And if not, then they don't. No, I, I don't I'm, not, I'm not obligated to accept anything. It's beyond my own personal logic. The, when Chazal referred to someone as uh, Epicurus, what they meant was uh, someone who, uh, not an idiot, Right? Never someone who is who's unintelligent, but rather someone who has intellect and uh, either because of or with the help of his intellect uh, basically distances himself from religion. You know, I'm intelligent enough, I think, for myself. I don't need anyone to tell me uh, that there is a God, there isn't a God. Kind of like an agnostic, you know. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but what's in it for me? What does it change for me? What does it do for me that there's... Uh, uh, a religion that there's a God, that he has expectations of me, we have mitzvot. Normally where you find a pikurus, you don't find someone who is unintelligent. This isn't what we'd call an amha aretz, an uh, ignoramus. This is uh, an, an intelligent uh, dissenter. This is someone who disagrees, someone who distances himself from the Torah, very intentionally, very specifically, and with, with methodology, not just out of the blue, not just because he, he feels like it. Uh, and normally, the expectation was that such an individual has nothing better to do than to do things that make him or her feel good. So I'll eat things that I enjoy, I'll drink things that I enjoy, uh, only because I'm the, uh, the judge of what's good and what's not, of what's pleasurable and what's not. If I do mitzvot, I only do the mitzvot that I feel like doing, or the ones that make me happy, or the ones that make me look good, or feel good, or sound good, etc. This isn't someone who uh, sacrifices him or herself uh, for the purpose of the, uh, of the Torah. So what does that mean, Like literally, you know, know what you should respond or how you respond to an Epicurean. You told me to learn Torah in the first part of the Mishnah. I'm sure I can appreciate this. Why not? Now you're telling me, know what you should respond to the Epicurean. So well, I'm even supposed to care about I, my, my whole course of study in school at the elementary or high school or college level, my whole course of study should be based on what I respond to people who attack my way of life. Or my, If you go to college in America or in Europe, yes, probably, you spend half of your time arguing with people who hate the Jews and want to see them in gas chambers. But uh, why, why would I change the way I learn Torah, either the content or the venue or the, the medium? You know, why, why would I give any consideration? to heretics, or to agnostics, or to atheists? Why, why does it influence me, or why does it, you know? It's an interesting question. The Mishnah goes on, and it says, you should know before whom you are uh, worshipping. In other words, when you're doing work, you should be aware of the fact that you're doing work uh, for someone, work that, you know, leads to something that has a, uh, an end, that has some kind of a goal, some kind of a target. And you should know who is the, uh, you know, the boss, so to speak, for whom you are working. And you should know that you'll, you'll be paid reward eventually. How, how does this Mishnah make sense in context? Because it's not very long, but it's a little bit cryptic. Be quick to learn Torah, because sure, Torah is a nice thing to learn. You have to make time for it. Now all of a sudden the heretics are coming looking for me, and it's my job to defend myself against them. I would say the opposite. You learn Torah, learn what makes you happy, learn what you know, fulfills you, what, 
what gives you a sense of uh, importance and priority and maybe helps you perfect your character. Why do you care what the heretic thinks about you? Some opinions hold that uh, this particular Mishnah is referring to a time and a place where these Epicurean philosophers were pretty common. And because they were common, uh, people were very often challenged. Let me digress a little bit, go back to what you were talking about before. When uh, my, my relatives came to uh, Israel from uh, Morocco, a lot of them came very... I mean, I love them, they're my relatives, but I'll use the word unsophisticated. Uh, they learned... It's <laughs> You're laughing like you know what I'm talking about. Uh, they had a tremendous amount of imuna. They had a faith, they, they believed, you know, this is our Torah, it's our Eretz Israel. They were not prepared for the Ashkenazim. <laughs> they were not prepared for secular European Israeli culture. It, it shocked them, and they never recovered from this. So, I had one uh, relative, I mean, an aunt through uh, marriage, that uh, her mother, when she came to, uh, to Israel, Basically, this is my, my cousin's grandmother from the side that we're not related. So when her grandmother came to Israel, she came with a, with a mitpachat, with a fula, like most of the women came from uh, North Africa. So one of her neighbors told her, no, you don't understand. Here in Eretz Israel, because the land is holy, you don't have to cover your hair anymore. You know, like she's trying to convince her to take it off. Just take it off, get rid of it. So because there's kdusha in the air, somehow your hair should be out and you know, like everyone else's. Hey, they made arguments like this. The Temanim, the Yemenites, when they came to, uh, to Kibbutzim, which was a great way to uh, secularize them, and that was the purpose, they would send them to, uh, to orchards. They would send them to uh, farms, basically agricultural uh, moshavim or uh, Kibbutzim. And there, the expectation was that they would basically stop being observant, they would stop being religious, and they would uh, adopt the secular Israeli lifestyle. So you had people who went out to the field on Shabbat and who told them, uh, here, look, I'm going to pick an orange from a tree. You see, there was no punishment, no uh, lightning, no, uh, no plague, no wild animals, you know. You can violate the Shabbat and it's okay. Nothing's going to happen to you. And a lot of people didn't really, they didn't really have a response to that. You know, they, weren't, they grew up in a community where everyone keeps Shabbat. Uh, my grandfather told me that he remembered when he was young, growing up in Sfro, uh, in, in uh, Morocco, that they caught a guy smoking a cigarette on Shabbat. Ah, the whole city was talking about it. Everyone in Morocco knew this guy and his family. <laughs> and, you know, good luck finding a job. <laughs> you know, never get accepted to a school. Bad shiduchim for the sisters. I mean, you know, every, everyone was shocked because the entire community kept Shabbat. You had a town of maybe... 8,000, 9,000 Jews. There wasn't one guy in town who didn't keep Shabbat except for this guy, and everybody talked about it because what happened? Then a few months later, uh, three guys got on a bus and went to Fez on Shabbat. That was also you know, a disaster. But when the whole community, when the whole society uh, behaves a certain way, no one's really asking you questions. No one's asking you questions, so maybe you don't ask yourself questions either. You assume. I keep Shabbat because my grandmother kept Shabbat. I eat kosher food. My grandfather ate kosher food. Uh, I don't work on... Uh, Yom Kippur, because my grandfather didn't work on Yom Kippur. So there are opinions that hold, look, you know, there always are these heretics. There are these people, agnostics and atheists, and you have to be careful about them. Spirit of Yom Ha'atzmaut, it's very interesting. We'll talk a little bit about Eretz uh, Yisrael and how this Mishnah fits in. At the same time, you know, so it's important to, uh, to know how to respond to people who question you for your uh, emunah, people who question you for your religious uh, lifestyle and the religious differences, there are commentaries who understand that you should know what to respond to the epikuros that's within you. In other words, you don't make your uh, living, you don't waste your career studying what other people are going to attack you about. I'm asking because there's an epicurean in each and every one of us. Why do I keep Shabbat? Do I really have to keep Shabbat? Do I have to be this strict about it? I mean, wouldn't I enjoy Shabbat more if I uh, turned on the TV, if I smoked a cigarette, if I uh, went out uh, to a restaurant? In other words, don't take anything that you do for, uh, for granted, as we say in English. Don't, don't assume that you do things that are right and you don't need to ask yourself questions. You don't need to analyze yourself. No introspection. On the contrary, 
Be an agnostic, be an atheist, ask yourself questions, look for the answers, you know. This actually fits perfectly with the first part of the Mishnah. It tells you, Be quick, be, you know, fast on your feet to find opportunities to learn Torah. And a complementary continuation to this, be a little bit of a heretic. Think like a heretic. You know, it sounds like a funny thing to say, right? Imagine there's a heretic sitting right next to you asking you these, uh, these questions. I don't know, a funny story about this that uh, I once spent uh, Shabbat in Tel Aviv in a, in a hotel. <laughs> A bunch of uh, relatives, uh, some close and some less close. Uh, and my wife and I, we were just married. And we said, Tom, it's a hotel, it's Tel Aviv. We have lots and lots of challenges here. We'll figure them out, but, you know, it's not so easy. Maybe the kitchen is not really under a competent uh, hashgacha. Maybe the mashgiach is some Chinese guy from the Tachana Merkazit. Okay, so... <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll buy some hummus, we'll get some pitot, we'll have maybe some uh, chicken or something. Yeah, okay, we spend $15, $20 before Shabbat, we'll have enough food to get by. And they can eat whatever they want, and that's okay, we're not telling them what to eat. So, so one of my relatives, he's a clown, whatever, one of my relatives, uh, he saw us, so we ate the first meal on Friday night, the second meal Shabbat morning, he says, we're eating out of, you know, containers. And so he says to me, Avidan, I have to tell you something. I said, what is it that you have to tell me? And he says, you know, I thought once about living a religious lifestyle. And I saw these restrictions and these limitations, and I saw the, the care that you have to pay. <laughs> Dawi doesn't know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so I, I, how everything is so strict and so complicated. And I said, quick, quick, show me Abu Dazara. <laughs> this is not for me, you know. Uh, you're not going to eat here because of this. You're not going to go there because of that. Shabbat, you have to be in a prison. I said, you know it sounds like that. It looks like that from the outside. But really, when he asked me these questions, you know, I was already a little bit, uh, 23, 24, I could say, dope. I see where you're coming from. I see why this would, would bother you. But Hashem, I have enough strength, enough understanding, you know, enough uh, emunah that I can, I can look past it. I could say, I know to you it looks like limitations. But for me, this is my life. I love Shabbat. I love being in a place where I don't have to answer the phone, I don't have any emails, I don't have to do any work. I get to uh, rediscover my neshama. I know to you this doesn't mean a lot, but that's unfortunate because to you it's like every day of the week. And every day of the week you're kind of happy, kind of sad, you know, some things you like, some things you don't like. But, but for me, Shabbat is a big deal. I look for Shabbat the entire week. I can't wait for Shabbat to start. Once it ends, I go back to my emails and I say, ah, Chabad, I should have left the phone and just, you know, <laughs> better making Shabbat uh, into Sunday too. So what he's telling you, Rabbi Azar, is first of all, be quick to learn Torah. In other words, look for opportunities to learn Torah. One of the best opportunities you're going to find is when you have a question. Because it's true, you can learn Torah, sure. You have the Halakha Yomit from Rav Eli Mansur. You have a couple other opportunities. You can get, you know, two or three sentences of Torah from any number of uh, automatic listservs and email accounts. But when you have a question, something's bothering you, this is an opportunity. This is something else altogether. This isn't learning because someone told me to learn. This is learning because I want to know. I have a question. Something's bothering you. Something's not sitting right. My whole life I thought this, and now I find out that. How do I reconcile the two? Uh, how do I uh, draw some kind of a conclusion? Maybe this is more important. Maybe that is more important. Now I have an appetite. Now I'm in the same way a heretic, you know, is looking for excuses, looking for reasons not to do things. I should be looking for answers to my, uh, to my questions. Step three in the Mishnah is uh, You should know before whom you are uh, working or, uh, or worshipping. Which is an interesting way of saying this. He meant to tell me, Baruch Hu, he meant to tell me you're, you're working before God, you know, be careful, uh, maybe put on a tie, something. Okay, on a simple level, uh, I'm, I'm doing all these things, I'm, uh, all these religious practices and uh, routines and rituals, and I do this, why? You know, who is it that I'm, before whom am I working? Before whom am I, I serving, let's say, in, in more religious terms? So, here is a, uh, a fascinating discussion. If Rabbi Lazar had meant to say, remember you're doing God's work, he would have said in the Mishnah, remember you're doing God's work. He doesn't know Hebrew. If all he's trying to tell me is, remember that this is God that you're working for, God that you're making these sacrifices for, God that you're you know, spending money on this mitzvah for, etc. He couldn't have told me this? I think he could. I don't know. I'm not a genius, I'm not a prophet, but I could have said that. So what does he mean when he says, 
know before whom you are serving? Sounds like a simple question, right? David. Dali fimi ta'amel. Know before whom you are. Are there any other options, maybe? Is there something I'm not aware of, or is something I may not have realized? Is there... Let me ask you the question another way. So, you know, Baruch Hashem, I'm married, I have children, and I wake up in the morning, and the babies are crying, and the older kids are crying, and the kids in the middle are crying, and my wife is crying, and uh, my neighbors are crying. <laughs> and then you start. <laughs> the whole house is on fire, and I'm crying too. <laughs> so I decide that I'm going to pray at the 7 o'clock minyan today instead of the 7.30. Normally I go to 7.30, now I want to go to 7 o'clock. And I'm doing this, why? Because you want to escape. No, I'm doing it because I, I, <laughs> I love HaKadosh Baruch Hu because I can't wait another half hour to tell Hashem how much I appreciate all the things that He's done for me. He gave me a crying baby, He gave me a crying teenager, I have a crying girl in 6th grade, a crying girl in 4th grade. What could be better than going to tell Hashem how much I appreciate everything He's done for me? I'm doing a mitzvah. Are you accusing me of doing a mitzvah for the wrong reason? Is it possible that one should do a mitzvah for the wrong reason? Never seen that. And if, for example, I were doing this mitzvah for a reason other than, let's say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who am I really worshipping? You know, where, where am I going with this? In theory, I'm employed by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I get my paycheck from him. But if I'm working for someone else, who am I working for? Don't say Microsoft. <laughs> I'm working for someone else. He works at Microsoft. You, you work for yourself <laughs> at this point. So, right. So I'm working for myself, which is a nice way of saying Yitzhar Hara or Malach HaMawet, or however you want to put it, uh, I'm working for what we call in Hebrew the Sitra Hara. I'm working for the other side, the, the way the, the Zohar refers to all, all things that are uh, impure and inappropriate and not Torah, the Sitra Hara, it's the, the other side. The other side, I'm working for Yetzal Hara, for my own ego, for my own personal advancement, development, my own personal serenity. I just... I want to get out of the house. There's an expression they use in uh, in uh, Rabbanut, what they call a, a, a daf yomi widow. La veuve du daf yomi. This is a woman who works hard during the day, you know, family, you have children, and she uh, anxiously anticipates her husband's arrival from work. And he comes home, and of course, the kids jump all over him, this one's crying, and that one's screaming, and I have a test, I got a good grade, I got a bad grade, you got a letter from the police. We have to, <laughs> we, we all have things that we want from Abba. And Abba, you know, he just came back from work, his head's a little bit full. So Abba decides he's going to be a tzaddik, he's going to be a malach. He's going to learn the dafa yomi. <laughs> I came from work, and work is difficult, but I do it and I get paid. And now I'm going to find a great opportunity right when the kids need me. And when my wife is really stressed, I'm going to go find an opportunity to enrich myself spiritually. It's a bracha, it's a blessing. She'll be happy for me, really. Now she's not, but... You know, one day she will be. So maybe there's more than one motivation why we do certain things or why we engage in certain mitzvot. Maybe uh, the one that we're uh, worshipping, so to speak, or the one that we're serving, uh, isn't always a Baruch Hu. Maybe sometimes there are other uh, interests that get, uh, that get involved. It's possible that I do a mitzvot for the wrong reasons. And this is very interesting because the last phrase in the Mishnah was this comment about Epikurus, right? So there are lots of interesting philosophical questions that we we can ask, you know, some of them are more uh, kosher, let's say, than others. And there are questions that we all must ask, that we need to ask. And we need to ask ourselves without believing. We need to ask almost heretically, you would say, I'm a heretic. I'm an absolute heretic. I don't believe that what I'm doing is for the right reason. I don't believe that I'm doing it right. I don't believe that I'm doing the best that I can. I disbelieve all of these things, and I insist on further inspection. In other words, taking things for granted, right, believing that you're always doing the right things for the right reason, is itself a form of heresy. Okay, now we're looking at this backwards. So this isn't the Epicurean who says, I never do mitzvot, because I think mitzvot are terrible. I'd rather sit here with my wine and my cheese, and I can enjoy myself, and no one can accuse me of doing anything for the wrong reason. Really, he's not doing anything at all. He's just serving himself. 
So I'm the proud, observant man or woman, and I can stand up and I can say, this guy, he's an abomination. He should be more like me. All my mitzvot are perfect. The only reason I ever do things is for pure spiritual enrichment, spiritual enlightenment. Sometimes I come to a level close to prophecy, but I'm humble, so I don't post it on Facebook. You know, I, I, I always do everything right and for the right reasons. Did you this, say that you have gava already, so you're not doing anything? <laughs> so first of all, you're already guilty of pride, which is true, right? Second of all, this really is the ultimate victory of Yetzir Hara. In other words, if I ever come to a point where I don't question myself, by default, I must be worshipping Yetzir Hara. I must be doing things wrong, because a Jew is always asking questions. People get upset. I see this all the time, especially on Facebook. People get upset. How come the Jews always uh, care what the Goyim think about them? So the Goyim, especially in Scandinavia, ask me why Scandinavia is so obsessed with the Jews, I don't know. They don't have them, they want them, they miss them, they, they're jealous of the rest of the world, some, some crazy obsession. So Scandinavia says, you know, uh, Israel is a terrible country. As Jews, we have a, a nerve. There's a special part of our consciousness that we, we care. You hear criticism and you think about it and you consider it and you say, Maybe we did something wrong. Maybe it's me. Maybe, maybe they're not all crazy. Maybe it's not a conspiracy. Maybe I did something wrong. And we take it seriously. Every time someone says something negative about you, you say, no, you're crazy, leave me alone. So I don't even think this person is a boor. This is someone who has no intellect, no, no honesty. People make mistakes, it's true. But as Jews, we're especially sensitive to this. We want to do the right thing. We want to get things right. We want to make people happy. It bothers us that some people will never be happy. It shouldn't bother us too much because if they're anti-Semites, they're anti-Semites. Nothing you do is going to make them happy. But there is a truth to this. There's a reality to this. And the reality is that we, we do want to be better. We do want to improve. And the only way to improve, the only way to progress and to advance is by hearing a little bit of constructive criticism, hearing sometimes things you don't like to hear. In fact, if you're on a higher level, you don't wait for someone to tell you. Sure, if you're married, it's easy. Your wife or your husband is very quick on the critique, <laughs> naturally. You're not leaving the house like that, right? Is that the shirt you're going to wear to work? People are going to see you in this, aren't they? <laughs> now, I was at the slaughterhouse today. I have an exemption. But, uh, you know, very often uh, you, you get feedback from someone else and you say, well, I didn't think about that. I wasn't aware of it. To be on a higher level is to be asking yourself these questions, to be saying. I remember hearing this once about uh, Henry Kissinger. There was a famous, uh, someone who later went on to have a career in, uh, in politics, who said that uh, she had Henry Kissinger as a, uh, as a professor when he was teaching Columbia University. Henry Kissinger, a famous uh, German Jew, he was secretary of, uh, of the state under Ronald Reagan. Uh, imagine Henry Kissinger here, Hillary Clinton here, but it's, it's an election year and I promised you on we wouldn't talk about politics. So, uh, so Henry Kissinger, before this woman turned in her, uh, her paper, she had to write a thesis, he said to her, is this the best you can write? She was shocked. She said, what do you mean? I mean, it's a good paper. I researched it. He said, don't worry about it. She said, but the paper is due today. He said, forget the due date. Is this the best paper you can write? She said, no, I mean, if I had more time, I would work on this. And that. He said, take it back. Give it to me when it's the best paper you know how to write. This is the best work you can produce. It's inspiring. Think about it. Work on it. Get it right. So naturally, we don't always ask ourselves these questions, but it's a good habit to be in. People who are looking to be good and looking to be better are always asking them, themselves these questions. It's not a lack of confidence. It's not depression. It's not, oh my God, I'm so terrible. Everything I do, I get it wrong. No, it's, you know what? I did good, but I want to do better. I'm looking for more. I should ask myself these questions. Is my kavana, you know, are my intentions where they're supposed to be? Am I as focused as I'm supposed to be? Could I do better? Right now it's uh, 6.30 and uh, the kids need my help, my wife needs my help. Would I really be the biggest tzaddik that I can be if I run away from the house now in order to go pray mincha, arvit, dafiumi, come back in three hours? Maybe a real tzaddik would stay home and help his wife and kids. And then you'd go to pray at 9 or 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Theoretically, it's possible. Now the, continue, the conclusion of the, uh, of the Mishnah. The conclusion of the Mishnah is that, uh, so according to one version, uh, that you should know uh, who is the, uh, the boss, and he's the one who's going to be paying your reward, your compensation. 
Another, the, the version that we happen to have in this particular Siddur just makes that a statement as opposed to a question, who is your boss? And know that he's going to be paying your, uh, your compensation. So this is a topic that's mentioned uh, of all places in the, uh, the Zohar Kadosh. The Zohar describes how Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world and he created the world such that uh, men and women have uh, free will. Libra arbitre. You can choose this, you can choose that, you can do this, you can do that. But in order for free will to be real, in order for the choice to be a real choice, it can't be that everyone who does good gets good, and everyone who does bad gets bad. Because then people would do it for the wrong reasons. I had a neighbor who started driving on Shabbat, and his car blew up. Okay, so I'm not driving on Shabbat. Is it because I love HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Is it because I respect the, uh, the Ten Commandments? I don't want to blow up. Maybe some people do. It's not my thing. It gives me a stomachache. So... I might start doing the mitzvot, or avoiding the avirot, and for the wrong reasons. My intentions aren't in the right place. If I have a neighbor who drives on Shabbat, and who has a very successful business, maybe even his paranasa comes from him working on Shabbat. Now I have a choice. Now I have a conundrum. Now I actually have a difficult decision to make. He works on Shabbat. He makes extra money. I'm not going to lie to you. I could use a little bit of extra money. Shabbat really that important? Is this really violating the Shabbat? Is this really such a big deal? I do other mitzvot. Maybe I can compensate. I'll do this one a little bit extra, this one a little bit less. I'll give more tzedakah, etc. So now I'm negotiating with the Satan. Now I actually have, have uh, you know, a deep and, and, and painful question to ask. If I'm doing things for the reward, maybe I'll do what he's doing. If I'm doing things because I really, really like the Shabbat, and I respect it so much that even if I have the opportunity to gain something, I'm going to lose it in order not to violate the Shabbat. Now I made a real choice. Now I made a real choice. The Zohar Kadosh pushes this one step further. The Zohar says, you know, that Hashem created the world. He created the possibility for good, the possibility for evil. He gave you mitzvot, he gave you avirot, and you make the choices you make. But in order for the choices to be real, Hashem gave the possibility to Yetzir Hara to give reward to people who worship Yetzir Hara loyally and faithfully. Meaning, not everyone who does avirot is going to suffer. In fact, some of them might prosper. That doesn't mean that they're going somewhere happy after 120 years. It just means that for the purpose of uh, you know, allowing a, a genuine 100% bona fide free will, the possibility has to exist for someone to choose good and succeed, or choose good and fail, or to choose evil and succeed, or to choose evil and fail. And so it's possible that someone lives a life of uh, debauchery, of hedonism, an Epicurean, your average French citizen, and, you know, does well, prospers, makes money, maybe uh, gets an advance, a promotion in work, etc. And sometimes you'll have people, what we call a tzaddik v'ralo, you have somebody who works really hard, who tries really hard, who invests everything he or she has into work, and it just doesn't, it doesn't click, they don't make it. And so people can look at this example, and look at that example, and now you have a really tough choice. So fascinatingly, the Mishnah, uh, when you look at it a little bit more deeply, is really talking about this. It's about getting to the bottom of things. It's about really appreciating how everything you do could be right or wrong, and you wouldn't know if you don't ask the question, you don't give yourself a test. And you should be testing yourself every day. Don't wait for someone else to test you. Don't wait for a Kodesh to test you. Don't wait for something disastrous to happen, for some kind of personal uh, calamity, before you actually start thinking a little bit more honestly and say, Maybe some of the things that I do, I'm doing wrong. Maybe the things that I'm doing right, I could do even better. I could do more effectively. I could do more efficiently. Here's a very bizarre, nonetheless pertinent uh, digression from the discussion that has everything to do with Yom HaTzmaut. You may or may not like it, but the discussion actually took place. When the State of Israel was in the uh, early stages of its founding, uh, in other words, there were uh, aliot coming from, for the most part at this time, it was uh, Russia. It was mostly Eastern Europe. Was it before uh, or after the independence? No, no, I'm talking about the 1870s, uh, ah, okay. 1880s, 1890s. Uh, you had a little bit in the beginning of the 20th century already some French and German uh, influence, a little bit more Central and Western uh, Europe. 
uh, that's how the pronunciation in Hebrew became so French, which really is not, uh, uh, it's anachronistic, but it's there, the, the rish concept in modern Hebrew, no offense, I don't mean, <laughs> but because there were Jews who came from uh, Western Europe, in particular, I think the Alliance had this thing about making the mitzvah, everybody should sound French, like the, the Mashiach would come if only, everybody, if only everybody had this, uh, this accent, which is an insult to Provence, I'm not going to get into it, but no. It's funny to people to hear French pronounced with a trill to R, like prendre. Yeah, well, you don't have many of these. Uh, when I was in Switzerland, old, I loved this. Yeah. I go out to the farmers, these people live in the shluch, they don't even have radios, and I hear them speaking French, they sound like Italians with a little bit of an accent. Too. It's, a, it's a cute thing to see. So, Greer. <laughs> so, the discussion raged, and uh, we have a lot of, uh, of literature and letters that we still have preserved from this period of time. The state of Israel is a good thing or a bad thing? You're looking at me like I'm uh, Jews for Jesus. It's a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, uh, well... Or a, or a Satma. Okay, so Satma definitely represents one, one side of the spectrum. Uh, a number of painful realities, okay? Reality number one, probably less than 5% of the Jews who, uh, who immigrated to Israel we're actually observing the mitzvot. Were they observing the mitzvot before going to Israel, or were they already uh, uh, secular before So, going? one side of the argument will tell you it doesn't matter, and the other side will tell you maybe it does. People came to Israel pretty much secular. Maybe ignorant, maybe more intentionally secular. I think ignorant probably speaks to more of Eastern Europe. Intentionally secular, this is, this is the specialty of French, German, British uh, Jewry, where uh, these are Jews of the Enlightenment, these are people who uh, maybe had more faith in the science uh, than they did in, uh, in religion. Maybe people who were tired of being persecuted, so they had a bit of, you know, ethnic identity, but not necessarily a religious one. So it's funny people beat the... me up because I'm Jewish, but, you know, I, I want a country, I want a, a, a nation of, you know, a, a state of my own but not necessarily a religious one, just that my ethnic identity really is religious, it's not so much a race, and this is where it became very complicated. So it is interesting when we... Um, so those people were pretty much the ones who uh, formed the reform movement, based on our discussion three months ago. It's funny that uh, there is no, ref no yes. not so much reform influence in Israel. So not, not 100%. I, I, don't, I don't concur 100%, because... Okay. The founders of the reform movement were maybe even more intentionally secular, but you'll remember that one of the planks in their religious platform was a, um, the elimination of, of Israel, of a return to Israel, of the, uh, yeah. the uh, redemption from the diaspora uh, as part of their system of beliefs. And so it should come as no surprise that the reform movement was opposed, you heard me right, the reform movement was opposed to the founding of the State of Israel, just like the Vatican. Maybe for different reasons, maybe for the same reason. The Vatican wanted Jews to assimilate and accept Jesus, and the Reformed Jews wanted to assimilate, maybe Jesus on his way, I don't know. So, you had Jews who were overwhelmingly secular in nature, not practicing, and they made, uh, they made Aliyah in large numbers. And maybe that, was, that accounts for the beginning of the Aliyah. Over time, what you ended up with was a dynamic where because so many secular Jews came to Israel, they and their friends and their uh, supporters and people who think like them from the same school of thought also started making Aliyah. And the more secular Jews came to Israel, the more religious Jews didn't want to go. That's it. Already the state has thousands of uh, chilonim. These are people who aren't observant. They're people who don't know, people who don't care. And, and this, uh, I feel more and more alienated by the nascent state of Israel uh, than I do by staying here in a Catholic country like Poland, uh, you know, worshipping the way I know how to, which is basically being Jewish amongst Goyim who are very anti-Semitic. And how come there was nobody who was uh, smart enough to, mount, to, to build an MJE or something like that there at this point and try to, you know, do some Kiruv, uh, the secular, the secular all, all Jews things. were probably not really interested in the Kiruv, in religious uh, yeah, outreach. And the, you the, could have got, the maybe, if you got 5% of them, it's already a miracle. I mean, how do I? The observant Jews weren't used to this as a concept, right? Ironically, 
the one Jewish movement that you can say really is very heavily based on outreach, and they never use the word outreach, is Chabad. Chabad, anybody know what Chabad's official approach to the State of Israel was? Never heard this. No. I'm going to make a lot of friends tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Chabad wrote letters to uh, the Rebbe at the time. It wasn't the last one of Menachem Mendel, Mendel Schneerson, Zechot Tzadik Libracha, who definitely passed away. It was the, his predecessor, uh, I forget how they refer to him in Chabad, as the the Frühdeke Rebbe, like the previous, in German, the previous uh, Rebbe. So they wrote him letters and they said, what do we do? Uh, you have uh, Jews moving to Israel, Israel is a holy place, but these people aren't really into uh, Kedusha. Maybe there's a concern that, uh, what happens to us when we get to Israel? You know, we go up, we go down, we get stuck in, uh, in limbo. So the previous Rebbe's response was, it's better you shouldn't go. Better you shouldn't go. Why? He was afraid, just like hap what happened to my cousin's grandmother, that, uh, that the Jews that end up in Israel are going to believe that them being in Israel is enough for them to be considered uh, Jewish and close to God, and they'll stop keeping the mitzvot. That's what he wrote them. I think this was in 1943 or 1953, I don't remember, but it was either right before or right after the founding of the state, and that was his response. I have a concern, not that Israel is not a holy place, and not that secular Jews aren't our brothers, brothers and sisters. My concern is what next? What happens next? You go to a society that's full of chilonim, probably you become a chiloni, and maybe you, you forget your religious it's much worse uh, with heritage. being with uh, chiloni Jews than with being with Christians. Also a good question, except I think, I don't know if this was an official part of the movement, I don't think any Chabad Hasidim stayed in Europe after the war. But still, America, in America, the whole, but the Hasid, Christian. Right, so America doesn't persecute Jews, at least it hasn't recently. Um, I don't, I think that the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, I believe, came to New York already. So coming to New York from Russia meant that 98% of the Hasidim were coming after him. And I think already that, you know, they, they pretty much came to their conclusion they're going to America. Uh, you had uh, Rav Kook. Who was uh, officially the first rabbi, the first chief rabbi of the, the Jewish settlement in Israel or Palestina, however they called it at the time? He was very uh, upset. He was very disappointed by the religious Jewish communities in France and in Germany, in England and in America, where he said that, uh, you know, this, the nascent state, and by then it was already clear it was going to become a state. Uh, would have looked much different if more religious Jews had made Aliyah. It's not that we regret the fact that the state was founded, it's just that the state having a secular nature to it makes life kind of difficult. It makes it difficult to reconcile, you know, the religious aspects of being a Jew with the uh, secular or, let's say, political, if you will, having a country, defending it, etc. On the other extreme, you had the Satmar Rebbe. This is Rav Yoel Moshe Halevi Teitelbaum. I told you I'm here to make friends, so you don't have you make all the faces you want. And <laughs> it's, so uh, the Satmar, I'm not Satmar, I'm not Chabad. I just you know, Sephardim. We try to to be straightforward and simple people, and everybody else makes life complicated for us. I don't know why. <laughs> So the Ashkenazim represent... One uh, to summarize it. No, it's it amazing. Perfect. The, the Ashkenazim really represent both extremes of this argument. I mean, the secular Jews that came to Israel were Ashkenazim. Rav Kook, who was the extreme <laughs> Zionist among them, was extremely uh, in favor of re religious Jews moving to Israel. And he was Ashkenazi. And Satmar Rebbe, who was extremely opposed to everything, was Ashkenazi. And the Lubavitch Rebbe, who was somewhere in the middle, also Ashkenazi. So Sephardim, it's clear. We have a state, we go. Why, where do these complications come from? So... <laughs> The Satmar Rebbe uh, wrote a very fascinating uh, treatise on this topic. I don't recommend that you read it. I'm not even going to name it. But he, he wrote on the topic, and he said that he believed that because this movement, because this new Zionist movement was uh, fomented by uh, an overwhelmingly secular population, he didn't believe it was possible for the redemption or for the Mashiach to appear uh, out of such a situation. And as such, he ascribed it to exactly what we just mentioned before, the name of the Zohar, how really this is like a revolution of Tum'ah. It's a revolution of impurity, a revolution of secularity, 
uh, a revolution of, uh, of uh, laicity, if you will, and, and the only reason that it looks like it's succeeding is because the Satan is paying, you know, the, the reward. In other words, that he, he called this a movement of the Sitra Hara, of the other side, so to speak, of spirituality, that uh, because it's all based on secularism, which is all really a lie and a betrayal of our Jewish identity, it's destined to fail. And so he told his Hasidim not to take part in it. They can learn Torah and get money from the government, but really they, they shouldn't take part in it, and they can get exemptions from the army, but don't have to uh, exaggerate. But, uh, but that was his approach, and he, he based it on this. In other words, it's very funny, because the, the modern Orthodox Zionist religious Jew really should find him or herself somewhere in the middle of this spectrum. Eretz Israel is tremendous. It's the greatest miracle of the past century. There isn't an argument to be made or, or a question to be asked. The nature of the state and the future of the state, the neshama of the state, where is the state going? What do we do with it? Uh, are we teaching our children more secular culture or more religious culture? Do we expect them to continue to defend it if we don't teach them anything about their identity, about their history, about their uh, heritage? So... It's, it's a, a, a difficult and painful question that we need to ask on a, on a yearly basis. Uh, I will quote the, uh, the great Rav uh, Yudal Leon Ashkenazi. Uh, I was going to ask uh, you a question about Rav uh, Ashkenazi. But... Who, who, uh, and, and it's a quote that needs to be you know, re-quoted a few times a year. Muriv Rabi Marav Rav Mamon Ratbi Shilita heard Rav Ashkenazi once give a shiur in which he said, that a religious Jew who believes he can learn Torah in a kolel in Brooklyn or in Paris or uh, wherever else in the world, in Shanghai, and that he's maximizing his potential and fulfilling his obligations as a Jew, he said basically he's a Christian. He said, with a bit more by way of explanation, uh, that Christian theology is the original reform theology that believed that all that's important is that you're a good person, you should behave nicely, you should be friendly to people, um, your, the technical mitzvot don't matter that much, so who cares about tefillin or how long my lulav is or how many matzot I ate in four minutes? The, sec the technical mitzvot don't matter so much, and they, they took the focus off of Eretz Yisrael, off of Lashon HaKodesh, you know, the Hebrew language, uh, and off of the Jewish people by way of uh, genealogy. So anybody who believes in Jesus is a Christian, whereas not everybody who believes in the Torah is Jewish. You have to be born to a Jewish mother, and if you're not, process of conversion, etc. So Rav Ashkenazi made the point that anyone who believes that they're maximizing their spiritual potential, basically anyone who doesn't ask the questions the Mishnah prompts us to ask, be a heretic, be an epikurus, are you really doing your mitzvot for the right reasons? Are you really on the right track? Are you really maximizing your potential? Is this what God wants you to be doing? And we need to be honest, maybe sometimes other interests get involved. Maybe there's nothing preventing me from making aliyah. Maybe there's nothing preventing me from uh, maximizing my potential. Maybe I could be doing things better or differently or more, or more effectively, etc. And he said this uh, maybe with a little bit of, uh, I don't want to call it exaggeration or irony. He was, he was very harif <laughs> on this topic of Eretz Israel. And his point was that if a Jew today can look back on the founding of the State of Israel and can honestly say, eh, maybe it was a coincidence, maybe the Satan orchestrated the whole thing, maybe there are no miracles, Hashem's not really with the nation in what they're doing, or it only appears that way for the purpose of being able to make a real choice, but in the end it's all supposed to come crashing down. And he said, this is absurd, these are obscenities. This is a time for us to be asking these questions. As Jews living outside of Israel, especially now, today, where you see everybody in the world attacking Israel for absolutely no reason, uh, the question becomes more poignant. The question becomes more, uh, more urgent. You know, uh, If back in the day, the Jews were living in North Africa, the Middle East, and, uh, and uh, Central, Western, Eastern Europe, could only dream about Israel, when it became a reality is when all these uh, different schools of thought developed. And I think the answers are becoming clearer over time. You know, if this really was a hoax, if it really was a charade, probably would have ended somewhere before the, uh, where are we now, in year uh, uh, 68, the state of Israel. So, uh, if this was uh, an accident, if, if people were on the fence, not sure if we go, we don't go, we support, we don't support, I think over time you're just going to see that there's just going to be some kind of a, of a, of a break, 
you know, something's going to give. And you'll see people from different communities making different choices. There are plenty of secular Israelis who aren't happy with the state of Israel because it's not uh, Arab enough and they want to you know, live under a Muslim dictatorship. So they can move to Syria if they'd like to, but some of them have chosen to move to New York instead. Uh, there are plenty of, uh, of Haredi, maybe ultra-Orthodox Jews who, who have no compelling reason not to move to Israel, especially since the state pays you money to learn Torah if you'd like to. Um, but I, I, I question, I wonder how long the window is going to be open, to put it that way. You, what do you mean? You really ask yourself, how, long are we gonna... how much longer do you think uh, world politics or history, or both, are going to allow us to continue to be on the fence? Because if you see the way things are developing right now, it looks pretty clear, right? I don't think many Jews in France and England feel very comfortable today. I don't think the Arabs are the only reason. And but agree it helps to have an indigenous anti-Semitic Catholic we're, we're population. We're probably next well. here. Maybe not next year, but a generation possibly, or so. Very, very possibly uh, ourselves or maybe our children will begin to feel very uncomfortable here in America depending on the immigration patterns and on, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, equitable uh, exercise of the law and of rights and entitlements, etc. Um... But I wonder, the, the way I understood from Rav Retbi what uh, Rav Ashkenazi was saying was that he didn't think the window was going to be open for very long, and he didn't think that you know, everyone who claims to be an observant Jew is really going to make the choice to move to Israel. There might come a time where the window for opportunity, the window of opportunity closes, and just like we had in, uh, in Egypt, then it was 20% of the population that came. Right now, the, uh, the world population already... It's We're not, already about 50. It's not half the population that lives in Israel... Yeah, but don't put it past people to leave Israel too. There might come some kind of a test at some point where people need to decide either they're in or they're out, either they're you know, uh, committed and going to leave, even if it means leaving behind a business or a home or a comfortable position in society and moving to Israel to become a small piece of a, of a bigger puzzle. Uh, but the, uh, the questions are asked. I would, I would conclude the way that I usually start when I talk about Yamat Zmaut, which is the way one of the Rabbanim in our Yeshiva used to say, the people who celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ot can be divided into two groups that are really four, just like we have the Mishnah and Shabbat and a number of other examples. There are people who celebrate, and they celebrate L'Shem Shalayim, they celebrate, you know, for God's sake, this is a tremendous miracle, it's a tremendous uh, historical uh, feat, it's, it's a wonder how this, you know, came into being, and we need to show appreciation and thanks and gratitude for the tremendous uh, miracle that is the modern state of Israel. There are people who celebrate, and they don't really celebrate Hashem Shemayim. They go, they have a barbecue, they eat, they get drunk, they listen to secular music, and they go to sleep. So it's not really a spiritual, religious uh, renaissance. You know, they're not exactly waking up and changing their lifestyle, but okay, so they're there. Uh, you have the people who don't celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ot, and they don't celebrate, but they do it Hashem Shemayim. Maybe, you know, Satmar or Hasidim, they're really concerned with the you know, secular nature of society. Maybe they're really concerned with the future of the Jewish soul. Maybe they're really worried about the secular nature of the uh, educational institutions and how most of the people in Israel aren't observant. So it could be that their concerns are uh, legitimate, you know, authentic uh, concerns. And there are people who don't celebrate, but not in the Shem Shemayim. Like, they don't celebrate and they do this for the wrong reasons. You know, people who throw rocks, people who have uh, protests, the Zodnaturi Karta, they're always, uh, you know, the collective IQ of the group is like three. But they always uh, remember on Yom uh, someone they find someone who can spell, and uh, they write their crazy uh, signs against the state of Israel, and they, they march and they go on parade. But nothing that could really be associated with godliness or religion or theology, just stupid posters that probably Iran is paying for. So, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, introspective time. I'll give you another uh, gem from, um, this is Rav uh, Levi Nachmani. He was not very well known. I mean, he's very well known in, in rabbinic circles. Rav Nachmani was a Mekuban uh, from uh, Morocco. He was a very, very special man. He wasn't, we're all familiar with the Abu Hatsira family, like uh, Baba Saleh and his uh, brother, his grandfather. Uh, Rav Nachmani was not at all uh, a very public man. In other words, people who knew him knew him. He was a genius. He was uh, kind of revolutionary in Morocco in the sense that he uh, incorporated a lot of, um, let's say, not necessarily Sephardi, Kabbalistic thought into his uh, philosophy. 
at Zohar of Sabato, my, our uh, Rosh Hashiva from his Berichu, he said that when, uh, at the end of the Six Day War, when the entire state of Israel, they were going on parade, everybody was marching, and they, this was, people were, were ecstatic, absolutely ecstatic. And he said that he was very, uh, kind of melancholy, not really, uh, not really happy, not really sad. And so, you know, Sabato saw him in the state and he said, I don't understand, we just won the war, we just defeated all of our enemies, how much better could it get, you know, what more could you, could you ask for? And he said, you don't understand, Eretz Israel is, uh, is the land of holiness, it's not just the holy land, it's the land of holiness that we've just increased the size of the, of the land uh, is like a loan from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we need to uh, repay it, we need to make good on it. So Hashem is telling us, this is in 1967, right? Hashem is telling us, I believe in you, I have faith in you, I know you can do it, show me that you're, you're dedicated to the land, show me that you're dedicated to your heritage, show me that you're dedicated to your history, and to the mitzvot, and I'll increase the size of the land for you. And he said, we need merits, we need uh, zechuyot, in order to retain uh, these parts of the country, because these are the holiest parts of the country. Basically, if you look at the map, right? I love this, the green line, the red line, it's amazing. Everything outside of the green line is almost without history for us. If you look at all that's mentioned in the Tanakh... Yeah, if, if the other way, it should have been the other way Exactly. Around. The only places mentioned in the Tanakh are Yerushalayim, Yehuda, Shomron, uh, you know, uh, Aza is mentioned by Yitzchak Avinu, was born there. I mean, Tel all the places that are contested, Tel Aviv is a, is a village in uh, Bavel. They, they like the name because uh, Tel implied uh, archaeology and history. Aviv is the spring, it's like renewal, but uh, Tel Aviv is not, it it's, doesn't belong on the map. I mean, it's Yafo is mentioned uh, uh, in Tanakh. That you have already. Uh, uh, I existed already? Yeah, you have Yonah Amin Amitai. So. So Rav Nachmani said something very, very insightful. He said that, you know, the, the, the land itself is always going to respond. Our, our, um, our grip on the land, our control of the land, is always going to be a function of our spiritual level. And the higher the spiritual level, then the more uh, evident it becomes to us, to the Arabs, to the rest of the world, that this is our land, this is where we belong, this is our history. And the weaker we are with our Torah mitzvah, the less conviction we have, the more difficult it becomes for us to justify, you know, our, our literal occupation of the land. Like, what is it we're doing here? Now, if you follow uh, the United Nations, it, it is a, a toilet bowl of, of an intellectual void. But uh, the United Nations voted uh, UNESCO, that, that stupid branch of the United Nations that supposedly decides for the rest of the world what's considered uh, a special, holy, or historically significant site. So, so they, they released a memo saying that the western wall of what's the current, you know, the Temple Mount, has absolutely no significance for the Jewish people or the Jewish nation. And like they, they probably hired four idiots with turbans, you know, to write uh, something uh, purely anti-Semitic. I mean, it's amazing. But, but something like this, you look at it from the perspective of someone like Rav Nachmani, and he'll tell you that imbeciles like this can speak and can, can you know, produce such idiotic statements. Uh, is, is a, a kind of reflection on, on the state of affairs. In, in other words, where it is that we're holding? Because it's going to be very hard for us to hold on to the land and insist on a secular lifestyle, insist on being just like the rest of Europe, uh, and insist on, on, on the nation not having some kind of Jewish identity to it. And insisting on a Jewish identity might offend some of the Arabs. They're very easy people to offend, these Arabs. Uh, but it might at the same time give the nation a little bit of a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, a sense of, uh, you know, a common goal, a common uh, trajectory. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll begin to not only uh, live this way kind of tentatively, but to really be convinced that this is where we belong, this is where we need to be, this is our land. And we, we say this with uh, total confidence. If they had questions back in the day, the questions have been resolved. Everyone who stayed in Europe died. Probably it was a good idea to go to Eretz Israel. Okay, they didn't see it then, they weren't prophets. Now we see that anti-Semitism is all of a sudden becoming uh, in vogue once again. Maybe we should ask ourselves the same questions they asked about 70 years ago. Should we really go? Is it really a good idea? I mean, we're not going to deserts and uh, swamps the way they were going. We're going to a developed state. So uh, I always look at the Matzvot as a, 
a time for introspection, a time for some honest uh, reconciliation, you know, of where we are, where we should be, uh, how the world uh, looks at us, and how we look at the rest of the world. And I think that's an interesting mission to, uh, to capture the, uh, the concept. So if you guys look tired, I'll let you go. But, uh, I might have lost a few friends, but at least I told you what I think. So. <laughs>